Good evening, I'm Sweat E. Balls, and our top story tonight, fish, should you trust them, or not? And, oh, <laughs> oh. Uh, you have something else queued up there? No, nah, I was going to say, and now over to you with the weather. Oh, nice, uh, nice, 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 nice. Then I realized I would make up a name for you, and that wasn't fair, so... Yeah, that's fair, because I, you know, let me speak for myself, you know what I'm saying? But, uh, yeah, cool, 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 cool. I feel like, I feel like that's just, just the right level of bad that we should just, yeah, just go with it. Just stay with it? (laughs) Nice. (laughs) That was terrible. Yeah. On on, on my hand, I mean, just cutting you off. Oh, no, 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 it was, it was perfect. I'm so happy about it. Good. Sweet. Because awesome. if nothing else, this evening we should be very precise and very German with the whole project. <laughs> <laughs> we should, except you don't have an Alsatian one, do you? No. Oh, thank God. I hate those French pieces of shit. Anyway. Yeah, but Alsatian Riesling's really good. <laughs> it's delicious. I love it. <laughs> well, we could either be very German, very Prussian, very, very organized, uh, or we could be very Oregonian. We could really just not have any clue what we're doing or why we're growing mm-hmm. fucking Riesling, but, you know, we're doing it, so. You're doing it. Mm. Uh, we're both. I mean, I got an Oregon Riesling here, and I got a uh, delicious uh, German one here. Got the eagles on the top and everything. Oh, mine, mine, didn't have an e- mine doesn't have an eagle oh, on the top. you bitch. It has a, a compass, half a compass rose, and then... Hmm. And then... The just squ- squ- squiggly lines. Squiggly lines. Yeah. Nice, nice, nice. Yeah. So, yeah, yep. I'm drinking a uh, Dr. Lucen uh, 2018 uh, dry Riesling. Uh, it's called uh, Red Slate. Uh, is the name of the wine. Um, I think they might have other, like, Blue Slate or some mm. shit, too. But, um, yeah. It's good. It's a it's a really solid. Uh, it's like I don't know. It's like sixteen bucks or something, and it's yeah. consistent. It's super delicious, and they they're really making an effort to try to dispel the whole like all Rieslings are sweet thing. Yeah. Because uh, there's just a big sticker that says dry on it. And you can buy Doctor Lucen basically anywhere, right? Yeah, yeah. Pretty pretty much. It's like one of the most uh, widely like uh, accessible uh, Rieslings. That one, and I almost got uh, Hugo. Or Trimbach, also both of those. Those are both Alsatian. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, things that are they're, they're super delicious, and so this is good. Uh, I'll get into it in a second. And the other one is Ovum O V U M, and it's their mm-hmm. off the grid Riesling. Nice. Uh, this one's from 2017. And uh, yeah, very Let's nice. See what you got over there, partner? Uh, I have from Germany. I have yeah. uh, a 2018. Carl Erhard uh, Rudesheim Riesling. Uh, it's defined as a cabinet. K A B I N E T T. A cabinet yes. fine herb, which um, has a definition that I just saw on their website. And then I. Oh, fine dry, I think is what that means. Really? Fine herb, yeah. Fine herb? Mm hmm. One second. Interesting. I, can, I can figure out. That's nice. Yeah, yeah. That means, but yeah. that means fine dry. Um, it's it's also dry. It's got, uh, it has, uh, seven point nine grams per liter residual sugar. So, um, hmm. so it's it's got you know it, it's got residual sugar. It's definitely got RS in it, but it's um, it's still very much, as far as reasonings go, definitely dry. Mm-hmm. Um, nice. And then the shot. Uh, my Oregon is a shod. Uh, S C H A A D Shad Cellars um, from the Shahala Mountains, um, and it also defines itself as dry, 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 just mm-hmm. below medium dry on the little uh, International Riesling Foundation mm-hmm. Federation, whatever it is, uh, the little huh. scale that they have that they put on bottles uh-huh. of Riesling now sometimes. Uh-huh. Um, it yeah, huh? It, I didn't know. Yeah, I've never heard of that label before, or the the producer, or whatever. Oh yeah, they're they're small. They're they're quite small. Um, nice. 
But they're a fourth generation um, farm, uh, originally growing, uh, I think, black cap raspberries and stone fruits. But then in 1980, they planted um, they planted a vineyard. Sweet. Yeah. So nice. this their their Riesling is so theirs is 11.4 percent alcohol, and then the German one I have, the um, Carl Earhart, is 11.5 mm-hmm. percent alcohol mm-hmm. uh and i would guess that the um i would guess that the shad get? has higher residual sugar uh mm. okay probably not much higher like probably like mm-hmm. i don't know maybe eight and a half nine uh-huh. but it, i could also just be completely wrong it could be lower and just be a relationship with the acid that is oh well, maybe like, there could just be less acid in it mm-hmm. The acid, uh, I think it's supposed to be the total acidity of the um, the air hard is uh, 7.6 grams per liter. So it's got mm-hmm. just, it's got almost as much acid, you know, as uh, as RS. So nice. it's, yeah. it, and it's got that balance. Like it's got, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's got significant acid. I would be very surprised if the, uh, if the TA in the shad was as high. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the Dr. Lucent I have is like 12% alcohol uh-huh. and it's, um, I don't know if it's bone, bone dry. Okay. Dog was being a jackass. Dog being a fucking jackass. Um, cat's food that was under this crate thing. Nice. Okay, I'm back. <sighs> you good? You back? Yeah, I think I just blew out the levels on my. Um, talking too loud. Nice. Um, yeah. Sorry. Uh, but yeah, so it's um, it's not totally, totally bone dry, but um, you know, it's not sweet certainly. Um, and then the ovum is um, it's got to be higher alcohol. Let me see. Yeah, thirteen eight, so almost fourteen oh, yeah. percent. Um, and it's, I mean, I'll go into describing it later, but or like the floor of the aromas and shit. Mm. Which Doctor Lucen do you have? The Red Slate, twenty eighteen. Red Slate. Mhm. Yeah, the ovum definitely has a bit more RS, residual sugar, um, mm-hmm. and yeah, it's a bit definitely a bit more like a uh, richer and. Um, yeah. So what's interesting is um, the ovum's cool um, for a number of reasons, um, but I definitely see some oak, um, mm-hmm. which you don't oftentimes see. Um, and it adds this kind of like rich, uh, creamy, you know, aspect to it, like you would expect the oak would. But when it, um, you know, combined with the the flavors that it has, like sort of the, the ripe riesling flavors. It's you know because it's like it's almost fourteen out fourteen percent alcohol so you think it'd be like oh, it would be pretty big but it it just kind of comes off as rich but it, has, it still has a ton of good acid so it's pretty refreshing it's like mm-hmm. um kind of like the like the the lemon meringue pie sort of sensation where you have that like richness but you also have that really tart um acid coming through yeah um so that that sort of things but it, it's very much more like a, like custardy and richer and yeah there is a sort of a big like glycerin kind of um, texture <laughs> those dogs okay they're losing their shit right now <laughs> don't know what's going on it's that guy with the gun from last time yeah well, it's not yeah. there i think it's just deer but mm, yeah yeah but um yes yeah, so you go back and forth mm-hmm. to the um to the dry riesling and you know I, I feel like it's kind of a joke where you get like it's okay so it's lime honey and like white flowers it's like the, the textbook sort of what you're taught with what, over how um, riesling tastes and smells and stuff mm-hmm. and this definitely has that it has you know whatever lime and blossom and all that all that kind of shit but um, this is it's not an overly complicated riesling but it's just very consistent and, and delicious and it's like I would I would happily buy this again. It's really good. Um, You're talking about the loosen. Yeah. yeah. You know, I'll happily buy the ovum again too. It's delicious. But mm-hmm. in terms of like 
just being like easily accessible and like this this, this would be a really good wine if this, uh like I would recommend to somebody where they're like oh like I don't really like Riesling it sounds like I've heard it's sweet I don't really want it you know it's like okay well it's not a big commitment it's like 16 bucks pick it up it's delicious yeah. and it's not the most complex Riesling I've ever had but it'll give you a relatively good idea of what like not what Riesling can be but it's like whether or not you like it sort of yeah you know and Certainly, then, yeah, um, for a dry style one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and then Ovum, Ovum's like this total like oddball. I feel like it's kind of it's kind of like a wine nerdy sort of thing. Yeah, where like like not everybody's gonna pick that out. Number one, but also um, have it. They might. I mean, like one of my friends, um, I like opened a bottles with him. I don't know, like a couple months ago or something, and he was like, "Oh, this is really fucking cool." And he's not. He's like getting into wine. He's not super into wine. But, you know, like, obviously, like we talked before, it doesn't, like, you don't need to know, you don't need an education to know whether or not you like something. Yeah. <laughs> so, he's like, yeah, this is delicious. And mm-hmm. it's like, yeah, it is. It's like, cool, all right, you like Riesling, you like stuff with oak on it, like, you like, because it's, it's, it's like a lot of different styles that are all together in this one, um, this one wine. Yeah. So, um, yeah, also it's from Rogue uh, River, Avia, which is cool. Or Rogue Valley, rather. Um, oh, that is interesting. Yeah, that, I'm getting uh, Rogue River. Uh, Rogue River Valley is this one that uh, blue cheese. Um, yes, from, um, yeah, yeah, Rogue. But yeah, so, yeah, so Southern Oregon, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, really cool. Yeah. I haven't had any of their other wines. Have you? Uh, yeah, no, I've actually had an Ovum Riesling before. Um, mm-hmm. That was quite good. Um, I, it was. It definitely had oak, definitely had oak on it. It, but it mm-hmm. still was very like well structured. It still had a lot of acid. Um, yeah, yeah, really, just wine that worked very well in the context that I opened it, which was um, mm-hmm. part of a blind tasting. Um, oh, cool! Oh, so, well, that would be weird blind. Yeah, it was a good. It was a good like you know. People got people figured out it was a riesling and like. But it, but it was also like, like some people figured out it was Riesling, but there was some debate about it because of that oak character. Like it's a, it, it, it's mm-hmm. a very like perfect like wine nerd wine, yeah. While yeah. also being completely accessible and something you can just drink and enjoy, which is a cool like, yeah, totally cool balance to hit. Yeah, yeah, it's fun. Oh, we should also mention, um, referring to like a like a wine's structure. Like, what do you mean by structure? Um, uh, usually when I am talking about structure, I'm talking about a combination of acidity and tannins. Um, that's what, that's how I think of structure. Uh, Mm -hmm. the way acidity and tannins create mouthfeel, which are not flavors. Like you can't identify Mm -hmm. particular flavors that go with them, but there are Mm -hmm. sensory experiences that define the shape that the wine sort of occupies in your mouth. Um, That makes sense. Yeah. It's sort of like, uh, you know, the, the, um. It's all the behind the scenes stuff. Like if you go to a if you go to a you, get, you go to a play, um, what you mm-hmm. look at, what the what the actors say and do, that, that's all the flavors. But then the structure is all the stuff behind the, the you, you know you're not thinking about, but is influencing mm-hmm. what you know you're looking at. Like right, right. What do you, what do you what do you think about like alcohol content? Like, what do you think that contributes towards structure? Oh, oh yeah, for sure. Uh, alcohol content sort of um, it's like the base line it's like the mm-hmm. you know like the base um to throw in another metaphor to confuse things even more like alcohol i, <laughs> I feel like tends to be like like when you're listening to like a rock album or something it's like the base line like you you really don't want to like mm-hmm. think about it but it's there mm-hmm. it's always there like <clears throat> yeah. and, and if you do want to think about it it can be really cool like it can interact with things in cool ways but most of the time it's like you know it's um it's not the focus of attention, um, right? Which, you know, isn't fair to Victor Wooten or whatever. But <laughs> alcohol is probably best, like best related to like the clef you're in, like whether you're in the bass clef okay. or the treble clef. Like it's like mm-hmm. what you know, what octave do you expect stuff to be played in, right? Mm-hmm. I would say that's where alcohol sits, because mm-hmm. if you have a bunch of notes, like if you have half of the uh, 
say you say you're drinking like a like a I don't know a, a Cab Sauv that's really really green or something like Cab Sauv should be a base clef wine, but they've just mm-hmm. like but they there's way too much acidity and not enough like roundness and like tannin, so mm-hmm. your every note is being played, you know basically in the treble clef. So it's like well, right. you just so that's that's like where I think of alcohol in terms of structure is like alcohol defines sort of the landscape that you expect things to live within, and then um, you know. Uh, Acidity is probably like rhythm, I guess, mm-hmm. and then tannins would be like the key that you're in. It, this is a very overwrought metaphor, but <laughs> it's working for me. So the problem is like why? Because I, I, I think we've talked about this, but like the, the nature of how people relate to their their senses of flavor and smell, we we yep. move to synesthesia really really quickly with wine, right? Because we don't have I don't. I don't think culturally we have a huge sense that we should trust very deeply our perception when it comes to like describing what we're actually experiencing. Mm-hmm. But weirdly, on the other hand, I think it's not quite like like the. It's not quite like music in that music there is like a structure out there of like. There is even if you can like figure, if, even if you can simplify it and not need like modes and all that stuff. There is still a a system of um, math that's associated with music that you can go and learn, and you can learn the common language for it, and that can help right. you like listen to music and take it apart and understand it if you wanted to recreate it. But you know, just listening to a song and then learning how to play it by listening to it. But then with wine. Like that, being able to do that does not help you enjoy music. It it can if you then like learn to play it or whatever. Like I don't know. It enjoying music is still separate from all of that. It's still separate from learning that language. And wine's kind of the same way. Like you you, it's still like you were saying, fundamentally based on what you enjoy, like what you. Because mm-hmm. you can listen to you know like, you can listen to. Uh, Led Zeppelin and be like, oh, I like that kind of rock and roll. And you don't know, you know, you're like, yeah, I like that, like, dark, broody, like, aggressive sound. And you wouldn't necessarily need to, like, that's that's a good functional description of somebody saying, like, they like stuff in a minor key with mm-hmm. sort of a, um, you know, driving tempo that involves a lot of, like, um, a lot of kind of uh runs up and down the key that it's in but like you don't need to you don't need to have that terminology to be like no i like you still know the mood you still know your emotional experience with it and the same is true with wine where people can be like yeah i don't i don't need to know i don't need to be able to pick out exactly what the the rs is in this but i um i know that i like it because it's not sweet right which uh the thing that i was going to mention a second ago um, I found the uh, tech sheets for the for your wine that mm-hmm. Doctor Lucen put out, and um, what did you guess the uh, RS was in yours? Uh, I didn't. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, no. What are they? You want to guess? Uh, eh. I mean, <clears throat> I know the one for um. I mean, the one for Ovum is definitely, I feel like it's definitely going to be higher. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, no, nah, I, I don't I don't really have a clear. Yeah. I, I don't feel like I don't have a good benchmark for, like, RS. Be a smell it and be like, taste it and be like, no, no, this is like five. Yeah. You know, like, I don't I don't, I don't, don't have it really clearly well, established. So it's not super fair because basically anything under 10 is going to come across as dry and, like, pretty much right. dry as. Yeah. Um, Little mm-hmm. little modulations down there can change fruit expression. That was what Julia was worried yeah. about with the um, the Pinot Gris, right? Is like levels of expressiveness of fruit because that was at I think six uh, grams mm-hmm. per liter. Um, but yours is eight grams per liter with a TA of seven grams for per the liter. Dr. Lucen. Mm-hmm. And then the blue slate that you were talking about. Mm-hmm them also making uh that has a rs of 40.6 grams per liter 
Whoa. The alcohol is only 8.5. But then the TA is higher. It's 8.5 grams per liter in the blue hmm. slate. So. Hmm. Like, is the ovum, what is it, like 13 or something? 14? For. Ovum? For RS? Yeah. Probably. You I mean, probably. I would. Oh, I, th- I, th- I thought you had the, the tech sheet up for that one. Oh, no, no, no. Sorry. I just had the okay. tech sheets up. Dr. I, I went looking because uh, Dr. Lucen is one of those producers that, you know, is big enough that you can find stuff like that on their wines. Oh, totally. Um, yeah. Like, they're, um, I'm glad you, I'm glad you got a bottle of Dr. Lucen because they're a, uh, like I think people could probably find this Earhart one, but like they're mm-hmm. they're just such a good benchmark producer. Like they're a, they're a producer that like you know they're the kind of they're the, what you're drinking is exactly the kind of wine that would be thrown at like a a Psalm taking their um they're doing their blind wines. Yeah, yeah. I mean it's it's super straightforward, um, but you know obviously when you're doing a. Uh, when you're doing uh, blind tasting, like everything goes in the window. You know, it's easy to be like, oh, mm-hmm. this is Riesling when it's like someone tells you this is a Riesling or when it's sitting in front of you and all of a sudden you just get, you get handed a glass of like white wine and they're like, all right, what is it? You're like, oh, fuck, I don't know. Yeah. Well, that's why, um, that's why Chardonnay is fascinating because Chardonnay can mm-hmm. come off as so many different things. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like that one really trips people up, but... Oh, the, this says uh, 10 grams per liter RS for the 2015 uh, ovum. Yeah. So I imagine it would probably be around the same. But yeah, it's definitely, what do you say, the, the red slate was like 7? The red slate? Yeah. yeah. 8 grams per liter. Yeah. yeah. Eight, Basically okay. the same yeah, as yeah. mine. Like, I, I, right. I'm willing to guess our two wines are very, very similar. Uh, but um, we didn't even talk about, so, so Riesling... Um, well, the, the, the diversion into Ekem isn't the worst thing in the world because Ekem is made of semion, and then the semion is just vinified to make a dessert wine. So it's picked at a very, it's mm. picked very, very late with very, very special, um, with a very, there's a very special climactic condition that happens in the part of Bordeaux where, uh, right. Where Ikem exists that has to do with a fog that precipitates this uh, noble rot version of Botrytis, which is very, very balanced and helps. Because um, mm-hmm. there's this whole thing in, in, in grapes where at, at a certain point, bricks are not actually being produced. Like, like sugars yeah. are not being produced and added to the fruit anymore. All of the increase in sugars is happening through desiccation of the, uh, right. of, uh, of the fruit. So the water is being lost and the, the sugars are just being concentrated and mm-hmm. botrytis can um, can concentrate that process and create this either it can just rot the fruit and look furry and be mold or it mm-hmm. can create this incredibly delicate incredibly beautiful in color uh, golden rot it's, it's called golden rot because mm-hmm. it's or noble rot but it, it's also called golden rot because um, I think it's also called golden rot. It looks gold. It's it, it literally is this beautiful deep golden color uh, that creates this really beautiful uh, flavor that they wait to have happen in um, in at, in the semi on Chem to create that to to create Sauterne. Um The same can be done with Riesling to create sweet Rieslings. Mm-hmm. Both of us picked Rieslings that are dry. So the one that I have, when it says it's a cabinet, that relates to the actual sugar content in the um, in the grapes when they were picked. And yeah, yeah. the uh, that j- just to that, not to how fully um, fermented through it was. So another thing that can be done is you know not quite letting the wine ferment all the way through so you end up with something that's like eight and a half percent and uh has much more residual sugar in it um right wait sorry can i interrupt for a sec yeah so there's a couple things i wanted to say so botrytis Mm -hmm. is the same 
The same stuff you see oh, yeah. when you think your your fruit is going bad mm-hmm. in the grocery store when it gets like fu- like strawberries get like that fuzzy white shit on yeah. it. Botrytis, same thing. Yep. Um, so what it does is it eats at and sort of decays the and creates holes in the surface of the like the grape skins, and in turns um, desiccates or dries out the berries or reduces the water content. Um, so then yeah, and then that can also. Um, as it proliferates, develop these these sort of savor, these uh, flavors that are sort of you know more like candy ginger, saffron, these sort of richer flavors. Um, yes, yeah, so that's a separate thing. But then also with Riesling, there's certain um, categories. Like you'll notice there'll be like Cabinet K A B I N E T T, be like Cabinet, uh, Spatlace, Auslesa, Beer and Auslesa, Trogon Beer and Auslesa, or Ice Wine is the is the sort of the highest one. But the Cabinet, um, Spatlisa, Auslisa, Beer and Auslisa, Trog Beer and Auslisa are all designations for, as Boone said, the um, the sugar content on which they're harvested, not on which uh, the, the, the sugar content of the, of the the final sugar content of the wine. Yeah. So Cabinet and, Spat, and Spatlisa can both say uh, Trocken, T-R-O-C-K-E-N, mm-hmm. which means dry. So you can have a cabinet trocken or a spatlace a trocken. They'll just be at higher sugar contents when they're picked, so there'll be higher resulting alcohol contents in the end, but they can still be both technically can or theoretically can both be bone dry. Um, but with Auslesa, beer and Auslesa, Trock Beer and Auslesa, they will all have um, some sort of effect of um, botrytis on them. Right. So they will all sort of possess that character. So when you go buy a bottle of Riesling, you know, there's all this German shit on it. How do I fucking understand this? And we can go into a different time how to how to analyze and understand German wine labels because there is a lot of like intricacy and ridiculous. Yeah, probably just do an episode about that goes into it. Reading labels because reading labels, all yeah. Labels. Or reading, yeah, exactly. And um, so yeah, so it'll say Auslese, uh, um Cabinet. And so this is all for a certain category of German wines, but they'll say those things on them, and then based on that, you will know. So if it says Auslesa, Beer and Auslesa, Trocken Beer and Auslesa, it'll all be um, affected by Botrytis. And then Cabinet or Spatlace might be affected by Botrytis. Probably not, but could be. And may or may not be sweet, yeah. depending on whether or not it says Trocken. And even if it it doesn't have to say Trocken, it may say Trocken. See, German wine's a total fucking nightmare. So, so you yeah. have to sort of know by producer and sort of know bottle by bottle basis. Because like either of us, we know a lot about this shit and even us like I didn't know was this red slate going to be dry or not did not it says dry on it in big letters bone dry no it still has a bunch of residual sugar in it so you never know well and the I mean for for Riesling I'd say you're in the neighborhood of what's considered bone dry there like you're, you're mm-hmm. not you're not well it's not a yeah that one doesn't say does that I think it says trocken no. On the red slate? No. no. It, it just says dry in yeah. English. Just, the, there's this whole yeah. But this is this is not like it's not like a um like a, a brut nature yeah. champagne. It's like it's not totally, totally dry. It definitely still has some residual sugar yeah. to it. But it just should just say like not sweet yeah. in big letters or something. But then um with this uh so this the bottle I have the it's a cabinet, but then it's a it mm-hmm. below that says fine hair, mm-hmm. which translates to fine dry which is you know hmm. you know not trocken i guess i guess it's some other designation because it's it's got you know it's got rs but it's not much it's you know it's very close in our in in rs content to your wine actually mm-hmm. um the uh completely lost that train of thought i, yeah, I you got the so the I think thing with Riesling kind of internationally is that it suffered a similar effect as what happened with Chardonnay out of California in that there was this cultural conception of what it meant that was unified by a mm-hmm. very particular ideology of how the wine should be made that actually only represented a small amount of the actual wine being produced. So people came to associate Riesling with this um, with this sweeter, you know, off-dry thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, 
lower alcohol but like noticeably sweet and right. that's really not true to a great deal of very very good riesling that's produced around the world that is um just dry dry as and really uh really like structurally complicated and acidic and really amazing uh in terms of like f wine for food like Riesling is this incredibly mm -hmm. great wine to pair with, um, like with fish, like halibut or uh, shellfish, or um, like I don't know. I would even pair it with like pork dishes, probably. Yeah, I can go with anything. Yeah, honestly. it's it's just it's just great drinking wine. Like it's just wine that you drink and you just want to keep drinking and drinking and drinking because it's like, you know, the those really great dry Rieslings have that same like balance of acid to sweetness like there's a little bit of sweetness like it's like like a really good glass of lemonade the, like the tension in mm -hmm. the in the tartness yeah, there yeah yeah it's like you know hard to recapture when you're you know i mean that's a whole other thing that like your the way your brain holds on to sense memory of like taste and stuff but like riesling hits mm -hmm. this very Dry Riesling for me hits this very cool, like emotional space of like a very a very sunny summer day kind of, you know. Yeah. Taste. Oh, totally, totally. Or I I wanted to the the flip side of that is you really have to be growing Riesling somewhere that it that it works like that you can get that long late period where you can harvest mm -hmm. at different levels of botrytization. Um and make selections of what you're so in germany they use a different term than bricks and i found it a second ago but i've lost it again it's uh some very funny word starting with Ooh, i found i found about fine herb so fine herb can also be found in german wine bottles an unregulated term but it usually describes wine that is halbtrocken which means <sighs> like literally translates to half sweet um, or slightly too, or just slightly too sweet to be called Hubtrocken. So if you see a German wine is described as fine herb, you know that it is neither dry nor very sweet, but somewhere in between. Mm. Yeah, you know, I'd say this is on so. the dry side of that. Uh, hmm. The so it's just some some un unregulated region. Yeah. The other so this is a blue label, like the the mm -hmm. one that I have. They all their well, they're, there's an exception to that, but they they, they have this fun label with a guy standing on the. Um, on the left side of the label, holding up a glass of wine, it's like this woodcut thing. They have a they have uh -huh. a, a red one that's Pinot Noir, a green one that is um, a specific vineyard, a single har a single vineyard harvest thing, and then a blue one, which is their uh, just um, estate, the Rudischheim, uh -huh. um, and the uh, their other they have a couple different ones that they put the blue label on. One of them is this. Um, fine herb and then they have a trocken that they also put that label on so mm. they make a they make i think a few different a couple different trocken um mm -hmm. ones and that that uh wow uh one of them has a residual sugar of 1.8 grams per liter so hmm. very very dry yeah one thing that i really like about rieslings um when they develop some age or even when they they some might not is that they will say this characteristic uh petrol yeah. no um so some people say petrol like what does that fucking mean to me that's sort of um sort of like um asphalt mixed with it's like if you stop at a gas station mm -hmm. on like a hot summer day yeah and you get out I'm assuming you don't live in Jersey and you can actually pump your own fucking gas <laughs> You get out of your car and whatever you smell, like that sort of sensation. Yep. So the mixture of the hot pavement with the gas and all that kind of stuff, rubber from your tires and whatever. That sort of smell will be in. But it, it's the it's wine. the smell of diesel. Like I, I mean, I've probably yeah. spilled diesel on myself more than the average person, but like it is that smell mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, and it's, yeah. It's one of the very special like. It's one of the very special, in the same way that like fungal forest floor um, 
Mm -hmm. vivacity, like the, the liveliness of fresh, healthy mushrooms and, Mm -hmm. and, and moss and, and loam and petrichor are all associated with really excellent, uh, Pinot Noir. And that's like Mm -hmm. basically unique to Pinot Noir. Like there, it can also do all these other red fruit flavors and red winey things quite well. But that is kind of reserved for Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. Riesling similarly, um, well, Riesling and other, uh, a few other varietals that are, that are quite related to it, um, Mm -hmm. can develop that quality, like dry white wines, uh, from like Alsace, uh, Gewürztraminer can develop that, but Gewürztraminer, I th- believe is a is a mix of um oh no I'm thinking of Mueller Turgau. Uh anyhow, there are there are, there are a couple other varietals, but they all tend to be kind of related to or or close in um where they're grown to Riesling. And um it's that like but Riesling is the is the like noble varietal yeah, like among Kerner. all of those. Kerner has yeah. that which is super yeah. good. So like the that, you know, I, the, that experience in wine is it, looking at it from the perspective of like how Assam would probably be taught about it, not knowing anything about that, but um, like that, you know, y- you would be given an example of that via Riesling because Riesling is like the varietal with which it is probably most strongly associated hmm. because it's like, a, a, you know, of that kind of wine, it's the most broadly made varietal, I think, you know, mm-hmm. for that style. Yeah, yeah, totally. So this this mm-hmm. um, Shad Oregon Riesling mm-hmm. is it's very good. It has this um, slight mealiness, like a like a, an apple that's just past mm. like it's uh, you know it's it's best that um, mm-hmm. I think Riesling can often develop when it's. Um, I think it's just very common for uh, New World Rieslings. Um, I think there's this... Uh, there's there's this thing about, about like, Riesling particularly where you really, like, you can grow it in a lot of different places and you can make it in a lot of different ways, but you really have mm-hmm. to commit to, like, doing it a lot. Like, Riesling is not a, like, a very accidental varietal in my experience about like when it works and when it doesn't i i I feel like people tend to make a lot of very strong choices and i don't know i i I like this one but i i it it, i i feel like i did a disservice having it next to this um this german one because the german one is just more clear and more uh more resilient in terms of its structure like it's it's its structure is a lot more uh more defined and a lot more robust yeah which isn't to say the wine is more robust the the shad is actually more robust in terms of like the nature of its structure but in terms of like the the definition and clarity of its structure the the air hard has Mm -hmm. more going on yeah yeah makes sense Yeah, but like there's a melony, um, uh, like a like a cantaloupe kind of mm-hmm. characteristic to the shad riesling that um, yeah. mm-hmm. I very rarely get from dry German rieslings. But uh, yeah, yeah, I guess it's just like that that riper expression of fruit in yeah. general, like than you would in a super cold climate. Yeah, and it, th- there's a funny thing with riesling, that, like so in Germany it gets ripe and then it starts to get botrytis before it gets overripe Mm -hmm. but then in oregon Mm -hmm. and a lot of other places where riesling can be grown it's one of the kind of problems with riesling is you can get riesling ripe and then get it overripe before it starts to get botrytis so there's this very important climactic balance of like when is it going to like when how long is the acid going to last when is botrytis going to set in how is botrytis going to behave and you know, usually mm-hmm. in Oregon, and it's very common throughout Oregon that uh, you know, botrytis happens, and it happens relatively swiftly, and it does not 
It mm-hmm. doesn't. There, the people make dessert wines in Oregon, and there, there are several that are good, but they're, you know, they take, they, they, they usually come from people who take the time to go out to their vineyard a lot, all mm-hmm. the time, like a lot generally, and are very close to their vineyard and are watching very, very closely because things happen very quickly because Oregon's so wet, but. Um, right. but that wet comes on badly late usually in harvest around when around when thing like things things usually have this chance to get very ripe before Botrytis sets mm-hmm. in. Botrytis isn't setting in when there's still acid in the fruit in significant quantities. At mm-hmm. least in my experience, like I, I I shouldn't be saying any of this because I personally haven't grown riesling, but. Um, mm-hmm. But I know people who do. I know, I know places where I, I, I know people with lots of differing opinions about riesling. I'm glad people grow it in Oregon. I think this is good wine. I'm glad that they're that they're doing it, and it's like it's a really cool expression. I think that um, I think that as with most white varietals in Oregon, and there are extremes of this, but people need to trust the acid more. Like I think people generally mm-hmm. can pick. There's like, and it, it, this all has to do with like, it's kind of like the cork thing. Like, this is this whole complicated arrangement of, of like labor and trucking and all of these logistical considerations around harvest that are really unfortunate, but that exist in Oregon's wine industry because, and in California's too, I'm sure, but the, the just exist because of the realities of sort of the market that all of these things exist in, which is pretty contrived, mm-hmm. but also completely native to the structure of American business models and stuff, because we don't see right. wine doesn't exist as like a cultural, uh, as a cultural identity in America in the same way that it does in any European place. Um, mm-hmm. we're trying to make it be that, but it isn't yet. It's still just an agricultural product. Um, but in Oregon people, I think Pinot Gris is probably the best example because people, People are like, oh, Pinot Gris, you know, we'll pick it when it's at 23 bricks and we'll be good. And that is a, that is just the worst thing you can do to it. Like, it's, it, it, if you, if you wait to pick it when you think it's going to be at 23 bricks, you're probably going to come in higher than 23 bricks because, like, because of how all those considerations tend to work and how the climate usually starts behaving by that point when you can get a reliable mm-hmm. reading of a reliable sample of that and anyways usually with like Pinot Gris which is much more widely planted in Oregon than Riesling is you you need more acid than will be in the fruit at 23 bricks you will start to lose acid pretty mm-hmm. pretty, pretty quickly when you start getting the kind of desiccation that happens they can get something to 23 bricks so I don't know I, I like I, I, I would be interested in somebody who is picking Riesling at say uh, 19 and a half, 20 bricks, seeing what they could do with that. Mm-hmm. Or does that be like, you know, and there are people doing that, and the flip side is that you then end up with, uh, you know, something that takes the enamel off your teeth, as people like to say. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. That was a whole useless diatribe, very specific to the organ industry, but people are growing Riesling out, out here, and it's. It's good. It's it's very very good. It's just like it's the other thing that people I think you know need to keep in mind when comparing all of these things. It's like this this other this reasoning I have from Germany. Like the fa- the people making it are I think the, the second or third generation on their farm, maybe third, and it's been in their family for 180 years. Maybe that's what I read. Mm-hmm. Something like that. It's nutty. Um, Nice. But then yours, like that's that's been in their family for two hundred years. Yeah, yeah, one hundred thirty years. Just like that's a long time oh, yeah. in a in a wine industry that's existed longer than that. And you know, I mean, I'm losing steam. I am too, man. I'm just rambling. Mm-hmm. This wine's oh, good, but I've got right. too much of it. <laughs> yeah. Alright. Yeah, dude. All right. What do we uh what do we go out on stop? here? Stop. Uh, 
pee pee. Poo poo. Pee pee caca. Pee pee. Pee pee caca. Goodbye. All right. Goodbye.